If you have a Bible, we're going to look in the front of your Bibles to a place called Exodus, Exodus chapter 16. We've been sharing about uh, change in our lives and change in our church, and we're going to continue that today. I want to tell you a story. Let's look at the next slide. This is Josh and Rachel Flanagan and their children. Uh, they're missionaries that we support in Cameroon, in Africa. They didn't start out in Cameroon, though. In 2011, uh, Josh and Rachel began raising support to go serve in the Central African Republic, which borders Cameroon. I remember uh, as Josh would come into our church building and uh, use uh, the offices and so forth for contacting churches, contacting individuals, and the amount of money they had to raise for their first two years in Africa, to me, seemed like an unclimbable hill. There, I thought there's just no way. I know how many Grace Brethren churches there are. There are that many. How are they going to get that support? But Josh was undetoured. He was not uh, discouraged. He kept at it, took them over a year, and they finally got over the hump and raised the support they needed. So they went to South Dakota, or where uh, Rachel's from, said their goodbyes there, and left for Central African Republic, and that was mid-year 2012. Around November 2012, late November, early December, there was an attempted coup that cratered the country. And when I mean cratered, the Americans uh, were told, every American was told to evacuate the country. The American assemb- uh, embassy was closed. They left. And Josh and Rachel had to leave with just what they were wearing and their children, all their belongings. They had to leave back at the mission station to get out of the country. It was just awful. They came back to the States, and they were shell-shocked. You know, what do we do? We raised all that support. We're, we're in Africa. Our ministry is just getting started, and now it's gone. The, the mission that we'd had there for 100 years is gone because of all that took place in that coup. They came back and regrouped and eventually landed in Cameroon. The point is that change, uh, especially if it's catastrophic change, can feel like you're driving down a road and you make a right turn and you realize you're never getting back to the original road. That's never going to happen. You're in a new normal. But it doesn't have to be big change like that. Even small changes can produce a, a real unsettling in our lives. And even really good changes, things that we're anticipating and looking forward to, building a new home, and all that you're thinking about, the design that went into it. And, and, but even that becomes unsettling when you realize you're moving, new neighborhood, new, new way to go to work, new grocery stores. All of that change just breaks the routines that our lives are built on. And we're going to look at what that change was like for the Israelites in, uh, in Exodus chapter 16. Let's go on to the next slide. There's a map here, I think, what's coming up next. Yeah. Now, the Israelites here in Exodus are 45 days out from having been freed from the slavery that they had endured for 400 years. And this is the route that they took where you see the red arrow is where they are as of Exodus chapter 16. It's been about six weeks since God had unleashed on the Egyptians one plague after another. And the Egyptians finally said, you guys got to go. Just go. But they had a change of heart, chased down the Israelites at the Red Sea. God destroyed the Egyptian army. And now the Israelites have moved their way down toward what we would call the Sinai Peninsula. And they're there with the Red Arrow now 45 days later. The Israelites had been enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. That means the parents at that time, their parents, the grandparents, the great-grandparents, the great-great-grandparents going back about 14 generations, had only known slavery. There was no thought of live out your passions. There was no coming up with a life goal. Uh, there was, they had an interview this week in the Olympics with Lindsey Vaughn, and she, uh, the, the big, great uh, downhill skier for the Americans. And they, as the interviewer, she said that when she was around four is when her parents... The entire family 
kind of embraced skiing. And that's what she embraced and how her grandfather was instrumental in that and, and helped her in the development of that. They interviewed him on, on television. There was none of that for the Israelite parents. There was no dreams for their children, no hopes for them. There was no, no one was saying in the Israelite families, you can be whatever you want to be. Because all they had known was slavery, and that's all they were ever going to know until God freed them. And that's where we are in Exodus chapter 16. So let's go on to the next slide. And these are the verses we're going to start with, how the story begins. You can follow along in your Bible in hand, or you can read them up here. It says, the whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Zin. And that's about where I showed you on that map, where that arrow was which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. So that's where we get it's about six weeks, about 45 days. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses. The Israelites said to them, or Moses and Aaron, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat, ate all the food we wanted. But you've brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. So the Israelites, in leaving Egypt, have this tremendous opportunity that's presented to them by the Lord. He's freeing them. And this change, now six weeks later, they're singing a different different song. Let me take a pause there and, and make this note. The, the exodus of the Israelites from, from Egypt serves in the Bible as an enormous billboard of what God does in our lives through Jesus Christ. See, the Israelites were trapped in slavery. They could never get out of slavery. They had no power to get out of slavery. They had no one to help them. They were trapped until God came and freed them because of his love for them. And in that freedom, they looked back at their slavery as something that had controlled them, but now God had freed them. And that is an illustration of what God does for us through his son. He frees us from something we couldn't freed ourselves from, the slavery that we have to sin. We couldn't have fixed it. There was nothing we could do to make it better. But God, through his son coming into the world, comes into our lives and does for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He gives us eternal life and he breaks the stranglehold that sin has on us. Doesn't mean we're perfect, doesn't mean that we don't sin, but he breaks the clamp that it had on us. And as the Israelites were freed from the slavery, we are freed from what sin was holding us to. And we are given something that we couldn't get on our own which was eternal life. So the Exodus becomes a a living example of what God does for us through Jesus and his coming on the cross. I don't believe, I don't know this for sure, I can't imagine, I'll put it that way, that any Israelite would have heard that God was going to set them free that would have said, no, I want to stay a slave. I, I want this life. And yet, when the opportunity comes and we hear of what God has done for us through Jesus Christ and we say no, that's what we're doing. We're opting to stay in the place like the Israelites were in in Egypt. We're opting to remain as slaves. We're opting to stay where we are and not have the eternal life that God is offering us through his son. So this, the whole Exodus story is portraying for us what God would do for us through Jesus. Okay, back to the story. So 45 days in, they start singing a different tune. And I've highlighted them in the color up here. So first, uh, the first thing they say in red, they begin second guessing. Did we make the right decision? Did we have all the facts before we made the decision? Should we go back and rethink it and reconsider it? They're, they're at this moment of a hardship they, because where they are, there's no food. And they're complaining. Everywhere they look, there's no food. There's no possibility of raising food. 
And they go, why did you bring us out here to starve us? And they're, they're second guessing the decision they made to leave Egypt. It's, it's as if they think or have in their mind that God brought plague after plague on the Egyptians to rescue them, but he forgot about the groceries. It's as if they can't conceive that if God could do that in freeing them, surely he's got a grocery list someplace. He just hasn't shown it to us yet. The second thing they do, they say, we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. They're, they're engaging in a revi- revision of the past. If you go back and read what their experience is like, it was what everything you think slavery was. In fact, the Israelites felt that, the, that if they ever stepped out of line or didn't meet the quota of bricks that they were to make for the Egyptians, their lives were going to be threatened. But they revise the past, and they think, well, we remember all that food we ate, the leisurely life we ate, and they completely change how they thought about their past life. And they have lost sight of what God was doing for them at that moment. Years ago, we, had a, we sponsored for the community a free car wash, and I believe we were going to raise money to send... Um, students to camps, and the, and the reason say, well, how are you going to raise money if the car washes were free? Well, the students went out and, and received pledges from people for every car washed, and the goal was to raise, or to wash 200 cars. So if, by raising, or by washing 200 cars, a student who had raised maybe 10 cents from one of their grandparents could go to the grandparents and say, we washed 200 cars, and so your, your contribution would be $20. And so in that way, they're going to raise money for camp, but also do something nice for the community. So we're out there washing cars. And I, when we put this together, I remember thinking, well, 200 hard cars, how hard can that be? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> You've washed about 25 cars, and you're like, done. And you realize, I mean, we've got another 175 cars we've got to wash. So there's one guy that came in to get his car washed. And uh, he came over to me, and he was a little bit honked off. And, and the reason was, he said, he got there ahead of some person's car. We were then presently washing, and he was a little upset by that. Now, I said to him, man, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. We just, you know, you lose track of all these cars coming in, and we're trying to know who's first, who's second. We'll get you a next car. You'll be next. In my mind, I'm thinking, It's free! <laughs> We're going to wash your car for free. And you're complaining. That's what's happening here with the Israelites. God has freed them from four centuries of slavery. And now they don't like because we're just kind of hungry. You didn't think of that. Number three. You can't quite see it. It's in purple at the bottom where it says, You brought us down to this desert to starve the entire assembly. They have taken the situation they're in and have described it in the worst possible way. So they're not only second-guessing, uh, they're not only re- revisioning the past, but they take their present circumstance and make it the worst it could be. We're going to die here. You brought us out here to die. Why don't you see something interesting in the story? Look down in chapter 16. Starting in verse 7. Well, verse 6. So Moses and Aaron said to the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. In the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Jump down a couple verses, around verse 8. The Lord has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You're not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Verse 9, Moses and Aaron told Aaron, Say to the entire community, Come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. Verse 11, the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling. Who are they really complaining about? Who are they complaining about? God, right. They're complaining, and God knew it. That's the point. He was listening. He was listening very carefully. And despite their complaints, here's the amazing thing. God continued to bless them. 
So God says in verse 11 or 12, tell the people at twilight you will eat meat and in the morning you'll be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening quail came and covered the camp and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp and when the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what's this? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it's the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they need, take an omer, and that was, oh, I don't know, three or four pounds. And for each person you have in your tent. And so that's what they did. And we're told later in the story that this uh, bread that was called manna, they'd make it into cakes and bread and wafers and things like that. And it had, had the flavor of the bread that's got just a hint of honey in it. And God just gave it to them. And so even as they're complaining, drawing the wrong conclusions, making it seem as bad as possible, wishing they could go back, God's blessing them. He's pouring out his blessing on them. Well, let's look at the next slide. There we go. Now, when a new pastor comes, you know, later in this year, and your search team is, is working hard. I mean, it's, it's hard. It's, it's hard work, but very satisfying work. Describe it that way. Very satisfying, but it's hard. Pray for us as we are dialoguing and we're beginning interviews and so forth. But when a new pastor comes, years one and two, roughly speaking, maybe off one way or the other, is befriending. The congregation is the pastor, the pastor of the congregation. Uh, years three and four is weathering. <laughs> Okay, now we know what each are like, really like. We've got to kind of weather this here. And in years five and six, we move to trusting. But this is what often can happen. We say, well, we want a pastor with vision. Then something changes and we say, well, I didn't know it was going to be like this. See, we do what the Israelites did. This is what I really want. I really want God to set us free. He sets them free. I didn't know it was going to be like this and no food around here. We want a pastor with vision. You know, I've, I've told our search team, I'm, I'm not real good on vision in terms, like, it's hard for me to look down the road five years and things like that. And I said, man, we need a person who can do that and who can rally us and say, this is where we need to go. And so a pastor comes and does that. And then something changes and we go, well, I didn't know that was part of the deal. Or this can happen. Let's look at the next slide. We say, well, we want a pastor passionate for evangelism. But then new people show up and things change because of those new people. And we think, well, it's all about them now. What about us? We've been here all along. We've been supporting this place. And now we're kind of just pushed aside. See, we, we, we start, we take what we want. And when we get what we want, we don't like it. We're, we're like the Israelites. See? Now, you would think that the Israelites would have learned their lesson that day. God had told them, only pick as much manna as you need for your family for that day. Don't be grubby. Don't hoard hoard it. Just what you need. Well, some didn't do that. So the stuff they had left over in the morning, God infested with maggots. Imagine getting up to that in the morning. But they didn't learn their lesson. Look at the next chapter, Exodus chapter 17. Let's go on to the next slide because I want to show you something here. Um, Next slide. There we go. Now, they've moved the red arrows, chapter 16. The blue arrows, chapter 17. They haven't gone very far. Maybe a couple weeks later. Chapter 17, verse 1. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin. And that's uh, not sin like do bad things. That's just the Hebrew language. And, the, and it's translating it letter for letter. They camped at Rephidim. But there was no water there for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? So now they're just a couple weeks after they're complaining about the food. Now they're complaining about the water. And they just, they just aren't learning. They're not getting it. So let's look at the next slide. When a new pastor comes... Will you grumble or will you trust? That's what it comes down to. 
That's what God was asking the Israelites. Trust me on this. Look how I set you free. I'm not going to drop the ball. It's not like I forgot to pack some food. We're going to be okay. Trust me on this. That's what God is asking of them and what he'll be asking of us. Trust. For sure, when a new pastor comes, things will change. That's just a no-brainer. We don't know what that'll look like or what form it'll take or anything, but it will. That's just the nature of things. The nature of life itself is that there's change, and we, we, it's uncomfortable. I get that. But what's before us, what was before the Israelites is, when it happens, will we grumble or will we trust? After 400 years, God gave the Israelites the very thing that they literally shed tears for, which was freedom. He gave them that freedom, and then they grumble about, complain and grumble about the freedom. And so as we look toward that day when a new pastor arrives, I asked the question, gave us the question last week, do we believe that God still has work to do in this church no matter what road he takes us down? And the question for this week is, when that happens, will I grumble or will I trust? Will I be like an Israelite or will I function like someone who has eternal life, born again by God and what he's done through his son on the cross and has given me freedom and I am going to embrace how he uses our church? That's a simple question. When change comes, will I grumble or will I trust? Well, it'd be a fitting way to close a service is, uh, or to close this part of the service is just take a moment and pray. Have there been some things in your life recently you've been complaining about that you know, having seen what the Israelites are doing, you better own up to that to the Lord and say, I'm sorry. Forgive me for my complaining spirit. If that's the case, Take a moment now and do that. And as John said earlier, God will wash that stuff away and cleanse it from us as we acknowledge that, God, I'm sorry. Help me not to complain. So let's uh, have that as a prayer time, and then we'll close the service.